Our title tonight, the message tonight, is called The Fatal Attraction of the Cults. Let's pray. And wherever you are, I'm praying tonight that the Spirit of God is going to touch your heart. I'm praying tonight that if you've been hesitating in a decision, you'll make one tonight. Because the truth of the matter is, the greatest cult in the history of the world is soon to come. And that's under the Antichrist, under the mark of the beast. And when that cult comes, millions are going to be deceived. But the principles that I'm going to give you tonight on why cults are attracting people today, those principles you're going to be able to apply to identify the Antichrist, the beast power, and the greatest cult that ever came. We are going to help you tonight identify cults that are present in Africa and around the world, but we're going to help you to identify the great cult at the end. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that Jesus is our Savior. Thank you that the Word of God is our guide. Thank you that the law of God is our foundation. Thank you that the coming of Christ is our hope. And thank you that you've given us the power of choice. So tonight as we study cults, I pray that you'd enable us to have eyes that are wide open, ears attentive to your word, and hearts receptive to it. In Christ's name, amen. The nation of Kenya was shocked. The news began to filter in about a place called Shakahola, where a cult had met under Pastor McKinsey. And the news began to filter in, first little at first, that a group of his followers were starving themselves, thinking that if they starved themselves to death, they could meet God. As the authorities began to examine that camp, and as some leaders were arrested, they began to exhume, exhume bodies, dig up bodies. First they found 12, then 20, then 50, and the latest count is 405 bodies. Why did these Kenyans follow this cult leader? And why do people throughout Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, why do people throughout Inter and South America and Asia follow cult leaders? Why do people in the United States, why did they follow people like Jim Jones down to the jungles of Guyana where a thousand of them took poison and died? Why did they do that? Why did people follow David Koresh to Waco in Texas in America and die in fiery flames? What, what led them to do that? Cults are nothing new. Let me take you back to the first century. And even before that, down through the centuries, Satan has attempted to deceive human beings by exalting man above God. And here in ancient Egypt, the pharaohs were exalted above God. In Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar was exalted above God. In ancient Rome, imperial Rome, you have the imperial cult of Rome, where a worship of a few select emperors were worshipped as God. You remember that John was the last of the living apostles. And John lived at the days of Domitian. Domitian was the only living emperor to declare himself God. I'll show you a fascinating coin discovered by the archaeologist. On one side of this coin is Domitian's, is Domitian's picture. On the other side of the coin is his son made God by Domitian. So Domitian claimed he was God, and he claimed that if his followers did not worship him, that they were not worshiping God and would be executed. We learn something from cults down through the centuries, as well as modern cults. The Apostle John challenged that cult worship, challenged emperor worship, and he was exiled by Domitian on the island of Patmos. And it was there God gave him the book of Revelation. 
And John wrote in Revelation, when the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet sounded, John writes in Revelation 11, verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded, and there, was, there were loud voices from heaven saying, the kingdom of this world became the kingdoms of our Lord and of Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Domitian said, I am the Lord, and I'll establish Pax Romana, that is peace on earth. John said, there is one Lord, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord, and only peace will come when Jesus comes, and the King of Kings returns, and his kingdom will be forever. I want to give you tonight ways you can identify a cult. John helps us there. There is only one Lord, and he's Jesus Christ. No human being or his word can take the place of the word of God. There are only false gods, but there's only one true God. There are many false Christs, but there's only one true Christ. Now, cult watchers indicate that there are 5,000 cults in our world right now. 5,000 cults. Millions of people are being taken in by these cults. Now, a survey of 700 different psychologists revealed that 26% of the people they counseled said they were former cult members. The reason cults are growing is because people are seeking. People are seeking something beyond themselves. Most people recognize that this world is in deep trouble. Most people recognize that something great and decisive is about to happen. Most people recognize that if life in this earth is all there is, if death is a long night without a morning, if the grave is a dark hole in the ground and there's no entry from the grave, that there's no purpose. So people go seeking, they go looking. They go looking for leadership. They go looking for somebody who has authority, somebody who's certain, somebody who's definite. But the problem is this. The cult followers are looking for answers in all the wrong places. They're looking for answers where there are not answers, and they're opening their minds to be deceived by Satan. If you understand why people accept counterfeits, it's because they do not know how to distinguish truth from error. And tonight, we're going to look at five biblical tests that distinguish the genuine from the counterfeit. Five tests. Five identifying characteristics of a cult. You can help your children not be deceived by cults. You can help a husband, a wife, a brother or sister not be deceived by cults. You can help yourself when the great Antichrist cult comes because everything that's happening now in those 5,000 cults, Satan is practicing. Satan is seeing how he can deceive people. And he's learning how people are deceived so that when he palms off the greatest deception of the Antichrist, he can deceive millions. So here are five ways to identify a cult. Number one, cults have a single powerful leader who becomes the cult's Messiah. That's what happened in Shakahola. That's what happened with this Pastor McIntosh, uh, Pastor McKenzie. He became the cult's Messiah. That's what happened with David Koresh in Waco. He became the cult's messiah. That's what happened with Jim Jones. He became the cult's messiah. That's what happened in Japan with Shakahoro Ashura. He became the cult's messiah. That's what happened in Uganda with Joseph Kabitri. So every cult has this idea where the human cult messiah takes the place uh, of God. One of the devil's greatest deceptions is getting us to look to human beings for our salvation rather than getting us to be anchored in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Now somebody says, but wait a minute, these people were sincere. Isn't sincerity enough? You can be sincere, 
But if you are following error, you can be lost just as well as not being lost. Sincerity is not enough. Look what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter, 20, chapter 16, verse 25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. Repeat that text with me, please. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of what? Death. Does that person think they're doing the right thing? Do they believe they're doing it the right thing? Are they sincere? Do you think those people that went out to Shakahola, do you think they thought they were doing the right thing? Do you think they went out there thinking, well, oh, we're deceived, you know, but we're going to go there anyway. Do you think that was what they thought? Not at all. There is a way that seems right to a man, but, the, but in the end it's the way of death. What is the way that seems right to a man? It's your own way. It's any way that's contrary to the Bible. You may think Sunday keeping is right, but there's a way that seems right that leads to death. You see, you may think it's right to smoke, drink, take drug, no problem. There's a way that seems right that leads to death. You may think living with somebody else that's not your wife is okay. Oh, that's okay. There is a way that what? Seems right. Any way that is contrary to the Bible may seem right to us. Cult leaders prey on their word rather than God's word. Anytime we transfer our loyalty to any religious leader and exalt that leader in the place of God, we are on very, very dangerous ground. That leader may be your priest. That leader may be, be your imam. That leader may be your pastor. Anytime we say, you know, a lot of times people come to my meetings and they say, oh, Pastor Mark, you preach from the Bible that the Sabbath was the seventh day of the week, but my pastor says this. My priest says this. If you put your religious confidence in your religious leader, you are preparing to accept the great deception at the end when the Antichrist, the greatest cult, comes. There is only one safety. And our safety is placing our loyalty in Jesus Christ. You know, when David Koresh took those people to Waco, there was a young man that escaped two weeks before the fiery flames. I interviewed that young man. And I said to that young man, share with me, what brought you to Waco? Why did you go to Waco? And what made you leave? He said, David Koresh was so convincing. He would sit down and we would study the Bible for eight hours together, but there could be no discussion. It was his word and that's all. And he said, why I left is this. When David Koresh said, I am the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation, this man said, that's enough for me. I have been deceived. I have been, <laughs> and he said, I have to get out of here. And so he left. My friends, millions are going to fall for the Antichrist in the future. Why? Because they take the word of man rather than the teachings of Christ. And they substitute human leaders for Jesus Christ. Now notice what it says in the book of Thessalonians. Notice how the Bible tells us that the Antichrist is going to grow. It says, let no man deceive you. Let no man do what, everybody? Let nobody do what? I don't want to be deceived, do you? Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that's the coming of Christ, will not come unless there's a falling away first. A falling away from what? A falling away from total faith in Jesus. A falling away from Bible truth a falling away, a listening to man's teachings rather than Jesus' teachings. That falling away is going to come, that apostasy. And that the man of sin is revealed. How do you define sin in the Bible? 1 John 3 verse 4, it says this. It says, sin 
is the transgression of God's law. So the man of sin has changed God's law. It says the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. It goes on to say, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So the final antichrist, and this is what Satan is practicing now. Satan is practicing by raising up 5,000 cults and more of these cults are going to grow and he's getting people to put their dependence in man. And these cults have a Messiah-like leader. Why? Because when the world is in its most major crisis at the time of the end, when there's famine and earthquake and fire and flood, when there's war and conflict, and when a powerful world leader arises saying that they're going to leave they're going to unite church and state and the world will be at peace. You see, the devil is preparing for that right now. So when the Antichrist claims to be the representative of God, claims he can change the law of God, and he commands all human beings to worship in the way he commands, what's the devil doing now with cults? He's preparing people for that. Do you know what the word Antichrist means? It doesn't necessarily mean against Christ, but the word anti comes from a Latin word means another or a substitute or a counterfeit Christ. So the Antichrist is not against Christ. He is one that appears in religious garments as a super leader to take the minds of the world captive. What does 1 John 2 verse 19 say? Little children, it is the last hour. What hour is it, everybody? the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is what? Coming. But notice what it says. Even now many Antichrists have come in which we know that it's the last hour. So the Antichrist is what? Everybody. He is what? Coming. But many Antichrists have come when? When have they come? Now. What are they? They're cult leaders. They're religious leaders who say, follow me, don't worry about what the Bible says. Look, there are no substitutes for Jesus, there are only counterfeits. The Bible says in Acts 4 verse 12, there is no, there is no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven whereby we might be saved except what? The name of Jesus. There's only one Jesus that was born of a virgin. There's only one Jesus that walked the dusty streets of Galilee, that walked the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. There's only one Jesus that touched the eyes of the blind and they were open, that touched the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped, that touched the withered man's arm and it was healed, that touched the lame and they could run again. There's only one Jesus that raised the dead. There's only one Jesus that carried the cross to Calvary's mountain. There's only one Jesus that hung on the cross for you and me. There's only one Jesus that took the nails through his hands and the crown of thorns upon his head. There's only one Jesus that raised, was resurrected from the dead. And there's only one Jesus that's coming again. Our faith is anchored in Jesus Christ. What do you say, church? Our faith is not anchored in any human being. Cult leaders become pretended messiahs, but our Christ our Christ is the one that has nails in his hands. Our Christ is the one that hung on the cross. Our Christ is the one that was resurrected from the dead. And Jesus says in Isaiah 45 verse 22, Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for there is no other. The first sign of a cult leader is that he has this messianic complex takes the place of Jesus. Here's the second identification of a cult. Cults substitute human teachings for God's word. Now, as I studied Shakahola, for example, I learned something very interesting. That Pastor McKenzie taught his people that if they wanted to meet God, they had to fast and kill themselves and die to meet God. Is there a text like that in the Bible? 
There is no text like that in the Bible, is there? You see, if you look at these various cults, they have the idea to come in this commune, to come in this community, to separate from the world. Did Jesus tell us to go out and live in the sticks and separate from the world and let the world be lost? Jesus said to his disciples, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, all this cult mentality is contrary to the Bible because there will never be peace on earth until Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, returns to the world. So cults substitute human teachings for the Word of God. Jesus said in John 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. What did Jesus say? Your word is truth. Your word is truth. Jesus wants us to saturate our mind with his word so we will not be deceived by these cult leaders. Now look, if any religious leader distorts the gospel, beware. If any religious leader discards biblical principles, beware. And if any religious leader downplays God's law, now, how, no matter how much love you think is in that church or how much power you think is in that church, if they distort the gospel, if they discard biblical principles, if they downplay God's law, if you stay there, you are preparing your mind for the final deceptions of Satan. Now notice what it says in Isaiah 8 verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. How much light is there? If they disregard God's law, how much light is there in them? How much, everybody? No light. Now notice what the text doesn't say. It doesn't say there's no truth in them. It doesn't say there's no truth in them. Why not? The devil loves to mingle truth and error. Suppose you had a beautiful soup and you sat down to eat that beautiful carrot soup. And I said to you, there's only a little bit of poison in that soup. Don't worry about it, eat the soup. How much of that soup are you gonna eat? How much of that soup are you gonna eat? Notice it doesn't say there's no truth, why not? Because if the devil did not mingle truth and error, he wouldn't deceive anybody. Notice it doesn't say there's no power in them. I've had people say, oh, there's so much power in this church. The Bible doesn't say there's no power because the devil can counterfeit power. The Bible doesn't say there's no love there. What does it say? It says there's no light there. Why does the Bible specifically say there's no light there? Because light is what you follow. Light is what you follow. And if this movement does not, if a movement does not teach in harmony with the law of God, particularly the Bible Sabbath, there is no light there. And God is saying to you, the only way your mind can be free from being deceived by a cult is to make a commitment to follow Jesus all the way. Because if you hold anything back at all, what's going to happen is the devil is going to play tricks on your mind. And he's going to mix truth and error together so much that you'll be confused. Down through the centuries, God has had men and women that have stood for the principles of his law. Come with me just for a moment to ancient Smyrna. Smyrna is one of the seven churches. You know, you had Ephesus, Smyrna, and so forth. And Smyrna is an amazing place. I've led tours here many, many times. This is the marketplace in Smyrna. Now, in the marketplace in Smyrna, they had statues erected to the Roman gods, like the god of Demeter, the god of the sky, and the god of Dionysus, the god of food and wine. Once a year, Christians, and anybody in society, not only Christians, they commanded Christians, Christians wouldn't do it, but everybody in the Roman society had to come into this marketplace that you're looking at on the screen, and they had to come and they had to burn incense to the false gods. If you didn't do that, you would be burned at the stake. There was a Christian leader, Christian pastor, by the name of Polycarp, and they took him through these arches into the marketplace. 
Now the word Smyrna means sweet smelling incense. When Polycarp came in there, this godly Christian leader, the crowd began to shout, this is the teacher of Asia. This is the destroyer of our gods. This is the father of the Christians. The Roman provincial ruler, Sagius Quatrus, tried to make Polycarp deny his faith. He said, old man, old man, you do not have to die. Old man, take this incense and burn it to the gods whether you believe it or not. And Polycarp stood up. He could not break God's law. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second commandment says, Thou shalt not worship any image. Third commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Polycarp says, Look, I can't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I can't pretend I'm a Christian and burn incense. The Roman gods would worship the sun. I, I can't do that. Polycarp responds, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me nothing wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And that godly old preacher was burned at the stake because he stood for the word of God at any cost. In the last days of earth's history, God is calling men and women to make Christ as their only savior. The Bible as their only foundation of their faith, the law of God as their only guide to righteous living. How do you identify a cult? Here's point number three. Cults manipulate minds. They coerce members into submission. See, cults want to use force. Cults want to use convert coercion. The beast power, when he rises, is going to do the same thing. And you see, the beast power, when he rises, the Bible says in Revelation 17, verse 13, these are of one mind, that is, the world nations come together with one mind. They will give their power and authority to the beast. That's this religious power that wants to unite church and state. They're going to give their authority to him. Notice what they're going to do. They're going to use pressure. What's that pressure going to be? Revelation 13, verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell except he who has the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. What is the mark in the right hand? What does that symbolize? It symbolizes pressure. So the beast's power will put pressure on you. The right hand symbolizes force. What does the forehead symbolize? It symbolizes the mind or deception. So the devil doesn't care whether he convinces you of error in your mind or whether he forces you to do it. But what's the devil going to use? The first thing he's going to use is economics. He's going to say, if you do not accept the mark of the beast, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. Now look, why is it that God today gives us the test on the Sabbath question and that some of us on the Sabbath have to step out and follow Christ with the possibility of losing our job. Here's why God's giving that test today. Because the mark of the beast is coming and every single one of us will be challenged at a time where we can't buy or sell of whether or not we are going to be faithful to God. My father was not brought up a Seventh-day Adventist. My mother was a Catholic. My father was a Protestant. My father worked in a factory where he was the foreman on the night shift. He worked nights. He worked with a Seventh-day Adventist. This Adventist began to share literature with my father. My father would bring that literature home and read it. My father accepted Jesus Christ. He accepted the fact that Jesus was coming again. He believed that the Bible was the foundation of his faith, and my father accepted the Bible Sabbath. As the result of that, he lost his job. When he lost his job, we, we wondered. You know, I was a Catholic, Mom was a Catholic. How is he going to support us? But my father kept quoting this text. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek you first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Dad began quoting for us. 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. My God shall supply all your need. And dad said, I don't know how God's going to do it, but I trust God. I trust God. He's going to supply our needs. Finally, my father went from factory to factory to look for a new job. And finally, he came to a Jewish factory that kept Sabbath, and he applied, and they said, we want you. They hired him. Initially, my father worked for them. But then after, he invented some new things for the machine. He started his own factory. And it's just an amazing story of God's grace. If you are working on Sabbath, and God calls you to keep the Bible Sabbath, Jesus will take care of you. Jesus will provide for you. But he's giving you the opportunity now to step out in faith so that you will not be deceived by the great cult that's coming. Revelation's conflict is between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. The devil will try to use force with an economic boycott, with imprisonment, but there will be men and women filled with the Holy Spirit, guided by the power of God, committed to Jesus, committed to his word. The devil will try to deceive but there'll be men and women whose mind is anchored in the Word of God, who day by day are saying, Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. Remember Jesus in Gethsemane. And Jesus in Gethsemane, he sees the cup. He knows before him is betrayal. He knows before him is the crown of thorns in whipping. He knows before him his suffering. He knows before him his Pilate's judgment hall. He knows before him his condemnation. He knows before him is the cross. And Jesus says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but what? Thy will be done. There will be men and women today. There are men and women today here in Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania here in Burundi, here in Rwanda, here around the world, in Sudan. God is calling men and women today, and they are stepping out. They are trusting Jesus Christ. This Sabbath, there will be thousands baptized. Why? Because they've heard the call of God. They've taken Jesus as their only Savior, the Bible as their only foundation, the law of God as their guide for living, the second coming of Christ as their hope. Here's the fourth way to identify a cult. This is one of the most deceptive. Cults claim to work miracles. And there are many people that are swept away by the so-called miracles of the cult. Look, when Jim Jones had this big church in San Francisco called the People's Temple, People would come there, and he would look at people in wheelchairs and say, you're healed, and they'd jump out of their wheelchairs. He'd look at people with crutches and say, wait a minute, and they'd walk again. How was that happening? Look, Revelation chapter 13. Can the devil work miracles? Look, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. What does fire represent in the Bible? The presence of God. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Tongues of fire. This is the false tongues movement right here predicted. There'll be a false Holy Ghost movement. That false Holy Ghost movement will lead people away from the Bible. And it will lead them. The false Holy Ghost movement will be the devil working miracles. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs or by the miracles that he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. So no miracle can take the place of the Bible. Saying to those that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and did live. So here is a false fire that comes down from heaven. That's not literal fire. You know, revelation is symbolic. It is the false Holy Ghost movement accompanied by signs and wonders and miracles for a society that it does not know the word of God. The devil has a final deception for mankind. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. No marvel, for the devil himself transforms himself into an angel of light. What if the devil 
as an angel of light appeared in a great stadium in Nairobi? And what if people were coming and miracles were being healed? And what if the devil said, the law of God is done away with, don't have to worry about the Sabbath? What if he left there and appeared in London? What if he left there? Could that be possible? Notice what it says in Revelation 12, verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea! For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has what? A short time. So as time gets shorter, the devil will pull out every deception to unite with the Antichrist to have this one world conglomeration of church and state united to deceive men and women. When Jim Jones was in Guyana, he was, he was claiming to work miracles. He claimed that he could to make blind see and ear hear. This is the Typical thing of the cults. You have a person that claims to be the Messiah. Their word becomes the word of law for their cults. They drift away from the Bible. They talk about this earthly idea of utopia or peace on earth. And they claim, contrary to the Bible, that they can work miracles. But look, here is a picture from CNN News of those who drank of this poison and died. The Bible is our safety. Jesus is our Messiah. The second coming of Christ is our great hope. Look, can the devil work miracles? Re Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. They are the spirits of devils performing signs or miracles that go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together to the great battle of the day of God Almighty. Here's the fifth sign of a cult. Cults deny your individuality. God has given every single one of us the power to choose. And what cults try to do, and this is what the beast power is going to do in the future, try to get everybody in this group think, everybody to listen only to the cult leader, listen only to the beast power. But the Bible says, Joshua 24, verse 15, Jesus says through Joshua, Choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. Let's read the text together or say it together. Just the first three words. Choose for yourselves. Together, choose for yourselves. We, God has given you the capacity to choose. You know, there are people that say, look, if I step out to follow Jesus, my husband's going to divorce me. If I step out to follow Jesus, my wife is going to beat me. If I step out to follow Jesus, all my friends are going to forsake me. I can't step out to follow Jesus because I've been in this church all my life. I can't step out to follow Jesus because I've been in this religious movement all my life. If that is your attitude, you're preparing to receive the mark of the beast. Because Jesus says, choose for yourself when you know what truth is. When God has convicted your heart, the Bible says in Romans 14 verse 12, so each one of us may have, may, must give account of himself to God. Each one of us must give account of himself to God. When you stand before the judgment bar of God, God's not going to say to you, what did your husband tell you to do? He's not going to say to you, what did your wife tell you to do? He's not going to say to you, what did your friends tell you to do? He's not going to say to you, what did your pastor tell you to do? He's not going to say to you, what did your family tell you to do? What Jesus is going to say is, I gave you the power of choice. I revealed to you truth in the Bible. The Holy Spirit brought conviction to your heart. Did you act on that conviction? God wants men and women who are willing to step out to follow him. And I am so thankful for the Africans who have such courage that they're stepping out to follow Jesus. I am so thankful for the thousands who've made that decision. They know that they may have to step out from a family. Wives are stepping out from their husbands. Husbands are stepping out from their wives. My father was baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist. My mother was not at first. I was not. My sisters weren't. But if he did not take faith seriously, we never would have made the commitment. Because he did, 
I was baptized next, then my mother, then my sister, then my others. You see, woman, you may be the key to the heart of your whole family. As you step out to follow Christ, others will see how serious that is to you. Husband, you may be the key to your family. Children, you may be the key to your family as you step out. You may be the key to your tribe. You may step out for Jesus, may be different than anybody in your tribe, but you step out for Christ and he blesses your life. There may be tribulations, there may be challenges, but you will have peace, you will have joy, you will have strength. God will take care of you. The beast power wants everybody to march the same. You become vulnerable to a cult, deception, when you look to any human authority rather than Christ. You become vulnerable to occult deception when you accept the teachings of tradition rather than the Word of God. You become vulnerable to occult deception when you are awed by spectacular miracles even if they're not in harmony with God's Word. Does God work miracles? Yes. Can God work miracles? Certainly. Will God work miracles in the end time to people be healed? Yes but he never works a miracle contrary to his word. Amen. You're, you'll become vulnerable to a cult if you fail to live up to your own convictions. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek what, everybody? First the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Some time ago, the scientists were doing some experiments and they took a little kind of like it's a worm but it has like feathers what, what's the do you have a, something called a caterpillar here do you know what that is give me that word David give me that word come on up come on up give me that word caterpillar I need to say that in Swahili it's, it's a neat word what's the word moo that's all yeah. that's too easy go sit down <laughs> moo okay so the the the, the well, I thought you were going to give me some hard word I couldn't pronounce. <laughs> Moo. <laughs> All right. So the scientists wanted to do this experiment on these caterpillars. And so they're, they're like a long worm that's like this, you know. And this particular variety always would follow the one in front of it. Are you with me? Are we together? All right. Okay. So they take this bowl and they take the favorite plant of this moo, this, this caterpillar worm thing, and they put the favorite plant in. That plant, eat that worm thing, eats that. Then they take this vase or this pot and they put all these moo, all these caterpillars around in a circle. So they're going like this. And here's this plant growing up in the center of it, okay? Now, it's the favorite food of the caterpillar. And here's what they want to find out. These caterpillars are built, they're made to follow the caterpillar in front of it. But, dot, 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 they go round and round and round and round. How soon will one caterpillar not starve to death, leave the going round and round and round, and eat its favorite plant? That's what they want to know, okay? So they watch these moos, these caterpillars are going round. They go around for an hour two hours, three hours, they go around for a day, they go around for two days. The caterpillars die because they will not, they will not eat that plant. There are some people that simply follow the crowd. There are some people when eternal life is right before them, they don't want to break ranks. They won't step out and trust God for their marriage. They won't step out and trust God to provide them for Sabbath. They won't step out from their church knowing that they can be part of a larger movement. They're like the caterpillar, going round and round and round. But Jesus speaks to you and me tonight wherever we are. We are not caterpillars. And Jesus says, choose you this day who you will serve. 